I don't know if you're like me. I can only assume that you're like me, that you start a day and probably there's a lot going on in your day. There's, there's a certain amount of busyness. There's work, there's errands, there's chores. For some of you, there's homework to do. And you're trying to plan out your day and, and just work through all of the details. And, and for many people, the best way then to, to make sure that they get everything done is they make a list. And so whether that's a piece of paper with a pen or on your phone, it's easy to then just write down what needs to be done. But I don't know about you. For me, I find that quite often what happens is in that moment of trying to get to the list, to to write it down, to find the piece of paper or pen or to grab my phone, then suddenly there can be this distraction. The distraction like the dog's uh, food bowl needs filling or, or there's some noise from one of the kids or there's a text message that comes in and you're distracted by the, the text which then leads you down the wormhole of all of the distractions of a smartphone. And by the time you get to the list, you've started to make those things but you're going, what was the third thing I was going to do? Or Amy and I have experienced this in, in the office where uh, you might just step out of uh, step out of the room and go into another room, and Amy and I have done this. We've looked at each other. What did I come here for? What am I doing? And it's so easy to forget. The, the forgetfulness that we experience as humans is pretty remarkable. We can. Uh, store all sorts of information in the short term. We can study for a test, for example, and pack in a whole bunch of information, and then in just 12 to 24 hours, it's all gone. And, and the intentionality that's required to move something from short-term memory to long-term memory is so crucial. If you're, if you're going to have that affect you, that knowledge being rooted in you, you have to do something very particular about it. The book of Deuteronomy, in its most basic sense, is a book about not forgetting and remembering. It's a message that Moses brings. It's actually three sermons. These are Moses' three farewell sermons to the people of Israel. That he has led them now to the edge of the promised land. He's come with a new generation, a new Israel, to a new land. And as they're on the edge of this new land, Moses isn't going to be entering. And so he wants to remind them of all of the things that the Lord has done. Because this generation that now stands before him, they were not all there when God thundered at Sinai. They were not all there. Many of them were born in the wilderness. Those 20 and under, they were there at Sinai, but everyone 20 and older because they had grumbled and complained against the Lord and against Moses. We are told in Numbers 20 and 21, they were told they would not enter the land. Sorry, that's Numbers 13 and 14. They had not believed the promise of God when the spies had come back. And as a result of that, they would die in the wilderness And so now as Moses is about to prepare this people to go into the land, he needs to remind them of God's covenant. Most simply, we could define covenant as a binding agreement between two parties. And in this, God is so committing himself to his people, and he is calling his people to be committed to him. Every covenant that God makes has an element of being conditional, If you do this, then this will happen. And an element of unconditionality. Regardless of what happens, this is what I will do for you. And God makes a covenant with his people. And now Moses is restating the covenant that was made at Sinai to Israel. He's reiterating it because many of these people, they were just children or teenagers when they first heard it. And many of them were born in the wilderness. And as a result, he needs to make sure that they know all of the things that the Lord has spoken. And so the book of Deuteronomy are these three sermons that Moses gives to remind the people of what God has done. He wants, them to, he wants them to remember the past, the present, and the future. The past things that God has done in his saving work. The present need to be faithful and the future hope that Israel can have. And this is the reason Moses wants to remind the people of these things. If the wilderness was hard and trying, the promised land will bring about different temptations. 
And the temptations will be even greater than the wilderness. And Moses had seen how in the wilderness, the people of Israel, when they had come out of Egypt, they'd they'd only been out of bondage and slavery for just a few months. And they were already grumbling and complaining in Exodus about going back to slavery. They had forgotten how terrible slavery was. And if that's how quickly Israel could forget all of their hardships in the midst of difficult times, then Moses was concerned about how difficult it would be for Israel to remember in good times. And so this book is a book of a covenant reminder. He reminds them of what God has done. He reiterates in Deuteronomy 5, the Ten Commandments. He reminds them to teach it to their children and their children's children, Deuteronomy 6. He fleshes out the practical implications of the covenant in terms of its faithfulness through to chapter 26. He reminds them of the blessings and curses in 27. He sings a song to them in 32. And by the end of the book, Moses dies. What is it that Moses wants to remind the people of? And more specifically, what does Moses remind us of? Three things. First, I want us to see, I want us to remember the past and see God's sovereign election. As Israel is about to enter the promised land, Moses does not want the people to forget their past. And in in Deuteronomy 7, Moses explains how God had worked in Israel. Why did God choose Israel out of all the nations? Verse 6, Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and and redeemed you from the house of slavery. From the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays to their face those who hate him by destroying them. He will not be slack with the one who hates him. He will repay him to his face. You shall therefore Be careful to do the commandment and statutes and rules that I am commanding you today. Here Moses begins by reminding Israel of their past. What did you do for God to choose you? What did God do, what did you do for God to set his affection and love on you? Wasn't it because Israel was so great and mighty and powerful and beautiful and amazing that God chose Israel out of all the nations? Well, that's not what Deuteronomy 7 says, is it? Why did God choose Israel? You were the fewest. You were the smallest. You, you were weak and foolish. He, he chose the patriarch Abraham and promised him that he would be great, a great nation, a man who couldn't even have a child. This was not a nation that looked awesome and mighty and great, that looked like a superpower. And what did Israel do to deserve God's salvation? Weren't they in Egypt in bondage and slavery? Did they buckle up their bootstraps and work hard so that they could be pleasing and acceptable to God? No, they were few in number. They're very outset. And then they were oppressed, and they cried out to the Lord, and he chose them. Why? Why did God choose them? Deuteronomy 7 tells us he chose Israel because he loved them. That's it. 
There wasn't anything beautiful about Israel. There wasn't some, something in their future that looked promising and hopeful that God decided he would attach himself to Israel because she was so amazing. He chose Israel because he loved them. He, he, chose, he chose to love Israel. And there is nothing in us that God looks at and goes, I'm going to choose you to be my child. I'm going to choose to rescue you from the path of hell because you're so amazing and wonderful that you could do awesome things. That's not why God chooses any of us. In fact, as Romans will say, Romans 5, that while we were enemies, while we were at enmity with God, when we hated God, He sent His only Son to die for us, to choose us, to love us. There's no foreseen faith. There's, no, there's nothing in our future that is, is bright that God says, I'm going to align myself with you. In fact, it was the 19th century Baptist pastor, Charles Spurgeon, who in his autobiography, he would say this so eloquently about why God had chosen him. Spurgeon would write, I believe the doctrine of election because I'm quite certain that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen him. And I'm sure he chose me before I was born or else he would have never chosen me afterwards. And he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me, for I could never find in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. This is the nature of our God. This is the way that he works. He chooses the weak and the foolish and the despised things because what he wants to display is not how awesome you are, but how great his grace and mercy is. He wants everyone to see that he is a gracious and compassionate God. He, he doesn't want human pride elevated because if there was anything in us that we could say, this is why God chose me, we would find reason to boast in that. We would find some reason to exalt ourselves and, and not exalt God. And as a result of that, he undercuts all pride so that we remain humble before him and that we see that there is nothing deserving in us so that we never, ever would exalt ourselves and become proud. The doctrine of election is actually a doctrine that creates a lot of humility and compassion and gentleness. Because if there is nothing good in me that would cause God to choose me, then I can have compassion and gentleness and mercy on people who don't deserve it. Because I am a recipient of undeserved mercy. Which is why the Lord says in this passage that we read from Deuteronomy 10, to have mercy and compassion upon the, the widow and the orphan, the fatherless, the sojourner. People who would have been defenseless in the ancient world. Have compassion on them because I had compassion on you when you were sojourners in Egypt. And so it moves the heart. Remember your past. Don't forget where you came from. Never forget it. And the reason that the Lord doesn't want Israel to forget the past is so that they would remember then, second of all, remember in the present to be fully devoted to faithfulness to God. And we see this in Deuteronomy 8. If the wilderness was a test then the promised land will be a test in a completely different way. You see, the, the wilderness was a test in that it was full of trials and hardships and difficulties, and the people grumbled and complained in the face of hardships and trials. So what will they do in the face of prosperity? If trials drive us to despair, prosperity drives us to indifference. And the danger then, Moses sees, is that if you forget your past, you will forget the present call to be fully devoted and faithful to the Lord. 
And so we read these words in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. Moses says these things to Israel. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I, am, which I command you today, lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and the thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who, led, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware, lest in your heart you say, you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. And if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so shall you perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. What Moses says to the people here is, you can't forget. Prosperity is going to tempt you in profound ways. So verse 14, don't be tempted to forget the Lord your God. This is going to be a real test that prosperity is going to bring. In verse 17, he says, the temptation is because you're going to think, by the power of my own hand, I, I've gotten all of these things. That, that pride wants to always exalt the self. Look at how my stocks are doing. Look at the great investment strategy. Look at how wise my skills are and, and amazing the things that I have done. And out of that, Moses says, you have to remember that it is God who made you prosper. God has given you all of these things, and you need to then be devoted to the Lord. Verse 11, he tells us how to be devoted to him by keeping his commandments. And the way that we remember his commandments is at the beginning of this chapter, Moses had said to the people in verse 3 that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You have to know God's word. This is why God's word would be read to the people. His, his law would be read every seven years by the priest to remind them of the word of God so that they would not forget, that they would do justly to those who are around them, that they would love mercy, that they would walk humbly before their God. This generation, this, this generation that had been young at Sinai or born in the wilderness, they would know nothing but a, a generation who had preceded them who had grumbled and complained the whole way along. Their parents and their grandparents had grumbled and complained. They would grumbled and complained about food and not enough water and about the hardships of the wilderness, about the bad leadership of Moses, and about how God was not treating them right. And Moses knows that the grumbling and complaining that had been so sown into the previous generation could easily infect the next generation. And that as they would go into the promised land, that they would experience great prosperity. Enormous prosperity. A land flowing with milk and honey. They would have to conquer the nations that were there, and they would have to be faithful to, to do all that God had commanded them, and that God would prosper them. But the danger of prosperity is biblical illiteracy. That's the danger that comes when you become wealthy. The, the temptation is, I don't need God. I've got, I've got this. Look at what I've accomplished. And this ought to give us, I think, a, a good pause. I don't know if you realize, but we live in one of the wealthiest postal codes, in the wealthiest country, in one of the wealthiest times of human history. We've seen enormous prosperity 
in our lifetime. If you own a home, for example, in the last 10, 15 years, the value of your home has increased dramatically, at least double. And the amount of equity that you have has so increased. This morning, you, you woke up. And for many of us, we would have started the day with a nice hot cup of coffee. Maybe you grind your own beans. Maybe you just have a machine that you just put in a pod and you press a button and bam, a cup of coffee is there. You ate something for breakfast, it satisfied you. You had your choice of what you wanted to eat, something that you like, that you enjoy. You got in your vehicle this morning, you turned on the engine, and it roared to life. You drove over to the church. There was a few bumps on the road from the snow, but generally it was really easy. You have paved roads, you have smooth roads. And you got here and you walked in on this cold day into this nice, warm building. After the service, you'll go home. Maybe you've already got oven, uh, the oven warmed and, and food in there and you're ready to eat and you'll eat something enjoyable. You'll be able to connect with people using technology around the world if you need to, if you want to. And all of these things, you have enormous prosperity. And the temptation temptation is to live and forget the Lord your God. The question then for us is, as your wealth increases, has the knowledge of God increased also? Have we made it our aim that in increasing wealth that we also increase in the knowledge of God? God isn't against wealth. Do you see that in verse 18? God's not opposed to, to wealth. And I don't want us to get this idea that, that wealth is sinful, because it's not. But it has a unique temptation to it. That as verse 18 says, it's the Lord who makes you prosper. It's the Lord who gives you wealth. And if he gives this, it is a test. Will you remain faithful? Will you be devoted to his commands? The, the temptations of hardship are very different than the temptations of prosperity. And so the Lord says in verse, uh, chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, what does the Lord require of you? Fear the Lord your God, walk in His ways, love Him, serve the Lord your God with all your heart. Keep His commandments and statutes. These are the things that the Lord doesn't want us to forget. What are the opportunities that He has given to us that we might bless those and, and care for the poor and the needy? How can we use the prosperity that God has given to us so that we might be a blessing and display His blessing to the world? He doesn't give us this prosperity so that we keep it to ourselves, but so that we could be generous. And it be, in being generous, we are trusting God. And so Moses reminds the people, you have to take this word in. This is your very food. This, you, you can be wealthy in the land and prosper and be starving in your soul. So take this word in. Heed it. And by heeding it, that means obey it. So remember your past. God graciously saved you. Remember your present by being devoted to the Lord, being faithful to obey and finally, I want you to remember your future, that there is hope because I will give you a new heart. Now, in the midst of all of this book, in the book of Deuteronomy, we hear some strong refrains. Moses continues to remind the people that they're tempted to fall into sin. And in chapter 28, he reminds them of the blessings of obeying the, the, of the covenant and the curses of disobeying the covenant. He spends more time on, on the curses, and then he sings a song in chapter 32, reminding the people about how great the Lord is, and singing about how Israel is going to disobey the Lord. And if they would not heed the Lord's warnings, they would go into exile. But in the midst of this, in chapter 30, verse 6, the hope for Israel is the hope of the future. Verse 6, Chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart 
and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and that you will live. What God is going to do is give Israel a new heart. He's going to, he's going to deal with the unbelieving heart, the hardness of heart that turns away from the living God. And all of these things, then, that we read in Deuteronomy are intended for us to see the glory of Christ. Now, to see the glory of Christ, I just need you to track with me for a minute as we retrace Moses' life. At the beginning of Exodus, when Moses is born, the Hebrew people are facing extermination and genocide by the Egyptians. They're casting the boys into the Nile River and, and, and killing them. And, and so the, the women are trying to protect, the midwives are trying to protect the, the Hebrew baby boys. And Moses' mother gives birth to him and protects him. But when she can hide him no longer, she puts him in a little, the Hebrew word that's used in Exodus 2 is an ark. Moses is put in a little ark. It's just like the ark, except in miniature fashion, that Noah would have gone into. And Moses is placed into this ark and put into the waters of judgment. Just as, as Noah went into the waters of judgment, so Moses goes into the waters of judgment. And just as it rained for, for Noah for 40 days and 40 nights, then Moses then spends 40 years in Egypt, 40 years out as, she, as a shepherd, and then 40 years in wandering the wilderness and at the end of Noah's time, when the Lord opens up the ark, he brings Noah into a new creation. And the promise for Moses is that he, after these 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, is going to lead the people to a new creation, a, a promised land. But Moses doesn't get to enter, as we saw last week. Moses, when he was instructed to use God's authority to speak to the rock and provide water, Moses abuses the authority of God and he strikes the rock. And for that abuse of authority, Moses is told, you, you, you spoke your own words. You, you acted using my authority inappropriately and as a result, you can't enter into the promised land. And so Moses now, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy... Chapter 34, he is taken up onto the, uh, onto the mountain, we're told. In chapter 34, verse 4, the Lord said to him, This is the land, Moses is looking out onto the land, that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, I will give it to your offspring, and I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. Moses has been the faithful prophet of Israel. He, he's prayed for Israel when she was sinful, interceding for them, forgiving them. And now he can't enter into the land. And Moses is described at the end of the book of Deuteronomy with these words. Verse 10. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, None like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and all his servants and to all his land. And for all the mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of Israel, all Israel, no one since has come along as great and mighty as a prophet as Moses. So where is the hope for Israel if Moses can't change Israel's heart, if Moses can't even lead the people into the promised land, if Moses can be a, a faithful, praying, forgiving leader, but he can't do what needs to be done for Israel, changing their heart, taking them into the land, leading them into conquest, then what hope is there for Israel if there isn't another leader who comes in Israel's history who's as great as Moses? Interestingly, Moses knew his limitations. And in Deuteronomy 18, Moses speaks as one who knows that the problem is that he also has a sinful heart. 
He, he's had a heart that has not always trusted the Lord. And that's why Moses says to the people in chapter 18, verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is him you shall listen, to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. And then, some 1,500 years later, another man comes along. And we're told in Matthew 3 and 4, that first he passes through the waters of judgment, that he goes into the Jordan River, th that river that was to be crossed to get into the promised land, and that he undergoes a baptism of judgment. And then we are told in, Mar in Matthew 4 that he's driven out into the wilderness, that, that he's driven by the Spirit, we're told, into the wilderness, where he spends 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Just as Moses and the children of Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness, now Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, where just as Israel was tried and tested and tempted, so in the same way he is tried and tested and tempted. But where Israel failed, where they didn't heed the word of the Lord... This man, Jesus, succeeds. And when he is brought in the face of, uh, of fasting and with great hunger and thirst, when he has brought this temptation by Satan himself, turn these breads, turn these stones into bread. What does he say? Deuteronomy 8 3. It's written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And where Israel failed, he succeeds. And as he succeeds, he obeys, fully obeys, saying everything as the prophet of God, fully obedient to the covenant, doing everything that Deuteronomy required of a good Jew, never disobeying. And how does it end for him? Death on a cross. He suffers all of the curses of Deuteronomy. All of the wrath of God for disobeying the covenant is put on the one who perfectly obeyed all of the covenant. He takes all of that wrath on him. He bears it all. He hangs on a tree. Cursed is the one who hangs on a tree. And there in the curse, he bears it all. And he dies. But that's not where the story ends. He's raised on the third day. And God justifies all of his obedience and, and vindicates all of his work and, and gives the stamp of approval. And he ascends into heaven where he sends his spirit. And then we're told that as he sends his spirit, the spirit who comes, Paul says in Romans 2, it does something, this spirit, he does something remarkable. Where Israel failed, where they were not truly obedient as Jews, Paul says in Romans 2.28, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not the letter. You see, what Moses couldn't do in, in, in giving the surgery of heaven upon the heart of Israel, Jesus does by sending his spirit. Where Israel could not obey the covenant and fulfill it in love, Jesus sends his spirit so that we might obey. And Jesus makes the heart soft and he brings all of the blessings, not of the Mosaic covenant, but of a new and better covenant. A far better covenant that Paul says in Ephesians 1 is this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless 
in love. And there we hear all of the categories of Deuteronomy summed up in those first two verses of Ephesians 1, verses 3 and 4. And what are those blessings that are given to you and to me? Where Moses couldn't change a heart, where Moses couldn't lead the people into the promised land, where Moses was a great prophet but had great limitations, what does Jesus do? He brings all of the blessings, redemption by his blood, forgiveness of of our trespasses. He calls us adopted as sons. He sets his love upon us so that we would not boast, but we would be to the praise of his glorious grace. And then he says, Paul says in Ephesians 1 verses 11 and following, he puts the seal that we will go to heaven, we'll get to the new creation, we'll get to the promised land, because he puts his spirit on us to guarantee the future hope. You're going to get there. I'm going to take you all the way home, guaranteed. And by doing all of these things, he does it so that you will not forget, but that you will remember. For when your heart has had heaven's surgery. Don't you want to know him and be like him?